for those of you who silently prayed along and asked God to deal with these requests, and also for those of you who raised your hearts in praise to Him. Our scripture reading from the Gospels today is in Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. King Herod heard about it because Jesus' name had become well known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that's why miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he's Elijah. Still others, he's a prophet, like one of the prophets from long ago. When Herod heard of this, he said, John, the one I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had given orders to arrest John and to chain him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias held a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing he was a righteous and a holy man. When Herod heard him, he would be very perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. An opportune time came on his birthday, when Herod gave a banquet for his nobles, military commanders, and the leading men of Galilee. When Herodias' own daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. The king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. He promised her with an oath. Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? John the Baptist's head, she said. At once she hurried to the king and said, I want you to give me John the Baptist's head on a platter, immediately. Although the king was deeply distressed, because of his oaths and the guests, he did not want to refuse her. The king immediately sent for an executioner and commanded him to bring John's head. So he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard about it, they came and removed his corpse and placed it in a tomb. This is the gospel of our Lord. When I was in Bible college and seminary, we had a, uh, a class that they called homiletics. Now, I don't know how many of you know what homiletics is. Homiletics basically is training in how to preach. And I remember that they told us there were several different kinds of messages that one could bring to a congregation on a Sunday. For example, there could be a text message where you took one verse and then expanded on that and explained it and illustrated some truths that went along with it. Or perhaps you could do an expository message, as we often do, where you take a passage and work your way through it and uh, explain what is being said through that passage. But another alternative is what we call a topical message, where you take a theme and then drawing from various scriptures to talk about that particular thing. This week, God has really been impressing on my heart to speak on a particular topic. And that's what I want to do today. And that topic is truth. Truth and truth telling. Have you ever told a little white lie? You knew it wasn't true, but you said it anyway. Probably because you thought you were trying to spare somebody from being hurt? Usually that somebody is you. <laughs> People tell lies, pretty much, for the purpose of avoiding pain. If you think about it, that's really why people lie, to avoid pain. Bo Bennett said, for every good reason there is to lie, there is a better reason to tell the truth. In February of 1970, the greatest of all country artists, Johnny Cash, that's my opinion, came out with a, uh, came out with a song called, What is Truth? It was kind of a protest song, which was kind of unusual in country music at that time. 
But you know, Johnny Cash was not the first to ask that question. Pilate asked that question in John chapter 18 and verse 38. When Jesus was before Pilate and facing the possibility of execution, Pilate said to him, what is true? Good question. Not an easy one, perhaps, to answer. For many years, I belonged to the service club known as the Rotary Club, and Rotary International. They had what they called a four-way test of the things that you would say. And the very first test, the first of the four tests, was this. Is it the truth? Is it the truth? Truth always corresponds with reality. W. Clement Stone came up with what I thought was a very good quote. He said, truth will always be truth, regardless of lack of understanding, disbelief, or ignorance. Now, it's not always easy to tell the truth, but it is important. In fact, it's important not just to refrain from lying, but it's important to be involved in truth-telling. We read earlier from a little book in the Old Testament, which we call Amos, named for the prophet who wrote the book. Amos had some things to say, and they were not easy things to say. In fact, Amos got in trouble for the words that he spoke, although they were the truth. First of all, God showed him a series of visions, and the third vision was a vision of a plumb line. Now, some of you who are good at carpentry know exactly what a plumb line is. And <coughs> no, a plumb line is not the same thing as like an apple line or an orange line or some other fruit. We're talking about a plumb line, P-L-U-M-B. And what is a plumb line? It's basically a weight hung on a string, and the purpose of that is what? <clears throat> to show true vertical. In his vision, Amos saw a plumb line. He said the, lot, the Lord was standing there by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. If you take, put a weight on a string, and put it up against the wall, what will it tell you? It will tell you whether that wall is really vertical, right? right? If that wall is leaning, it's going to show up. Because the plumb line is always true vertical. <coughs> and God, the Lord, used this as an illustration to Amos. He pointed out to him, basically, that the people were not in line with truth. And in fact, he said, the high places will be deserted, the sanctuaries will be in ruins. I will rise up against the house of Jeroboam, Jeroboam being the king at the time, with a sword. Well, when Amos made that prophecy, when he shared that with the people, he did not get a very positive response. And Messiah the priest sent word to King Jeroboam, and he said, Amos has conspired against you right here in the house of Israel. The land cannot endure his words. You know, sometimes when people are uh, wanting to really understand the truth of a the matter, they'll say to someone, give it to me straight, right? Give it to me straight. A plumb line will tell you if it's straight. Giving it to somebody straight means you're telling them the unvarnished truth without embellishment. In court, they ask you, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me God. That's an oath. An oath is an especially binding promise. I heard the story of a judge who said to a lady with a reputation for embellishing the truth, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and stop there? <coughs> we should develop such a reputation for integrity that people will know that if you say it, they can believe it. 
came across a quotation from Albert Einstein. He said, whoever is careless with the truth in small matters cannot be trusted with important matters. Truth-telling is not always popular. Amos told the truth. And when Amos told the truth, the priest reported him to the king. The religious authority reported him to the political authority, and the result was that he was banished from the northern kingdom. At this point in the history of the Jewish people, the, uh, the great kingdom that had existed under David and Solomon had been split in two, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Now Amos is speaking against the northern kingdom of Israel and its king Jeroboam and the evil things that he's doing. And Jeroboam says, get out of my kingdom. Go to Judah. You go do your, your thing down there. But you can't talk here anymore. Did that stop Amos from telling the truth? It did not. In fact, he became even more blunt. We stopped our reading this morning with verse 15, but if we had read a little further, we would have seen and heard what Amos said to King Amaziah. Let me, let me share this with you. This is the truth that the prophet spoke to the king. He said, Your wife will be a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters will fall by the sword and your land will be divided up with a measuring line. You yourself will die on pagan soil, and Israel will certainly go into exile from its homeland. Wow. Imagine getting the job of having to deliver that message to the king of the country, who's already ticked off with you and banishing you from his kingdom. You know, sometimes those who speak for God hesitate to tell the whole truth. The gospel is good news. But it also contains a warning for those who reject the truth of the message. A warning is not a negative thing. A threat is the negative counterpart of a warning. If a blind man is about to step in front of a fast-moving vehicle and you holler and he stops and he doesn't get hurt, the warning that you gave was not a negative thing, it was a positive thing. It saved somebody from being severely injured. A warning, when God gives it, is a positive thing, but it is also a serious and a sobering thing. The Apostle Paul said, You know that I did not avoid proclaiming to you anything that was profitable. Acts 20.20 20. Oswald Chambers, a great man of God, some of you will recognize it, his name from, from his most famous devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest. Oswald Chambers said, Never water down the Word of God, but preach it in its undiluted sternness. When you tell the truth, when you tell God's truth, you don't always get a positive response. Amos told the truth, and he was banished. John the Baptist told the truth, and he was beheaded. Jesus told the truth, and he was crucified. Perhaps you say, I'm sure glad those kinds of things don't happen anymore. <laughs> Some of you were at the men's breakfast yesterday morning. We had a guest speaker here to talk to us. His, uh, well, he goes by June because his real name is impossibly long and I couldn't begin to remember it, let alone articulate it. June was originally from the Philippines, but he spent 27 years working in Saudi Arabia. And he shared with the guys yesterday how he was arrested for being in attendance at a Christian church meeting. And he was forced to recant his Christian faith and, and say something in Arabic that basically proclaimed that uh, Muhammad was the prophet of Allah, the true God. 
on pain of having his hand cut off. And he was made to sign a paper that said if he participated again in Christian activities, his hand would be cut off. And if he did it again, they'd cut the other hand off. And if he offended a third time, they would behead him. And we're talking about modern times. This is not something that happened hundreds of years ago. The pastor of the underground church of which he was a part received 500 lashes with a metal tip whip. And yet we hesitate sometimes to tell the truth because somebody might be offended or mock us or get upset. As I was preparing this message, I looked into my concordance. A concordance is a, a book that lists all the various words that are in the Bible and helps you to locate them by reference. There's other things that can be accomplished with the concordance as well, but it's a very useful tool. And you know what I discovered? I discovered that Jesus used the phrase, I tell you the truth, over and over and over again. By my count, 30 times in the Gospel of Matthew alone, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. In Mark, at least 13 times, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. In Luke, nine times, it is recorded that Jesus said, I tell you the truth. And in John, 27 times by my count, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. That's uh, 79 times that Scripture records that Jesus said, I tell you the truth. In fact, there was no other phrase that Jesus used as often as this one. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Jesus not only said, I tell you the truth, he said, I am the truth. Now, you could say about another person that they tell the truth or that he or she is truthful. But Jesus is the only one about whom it may be said he is the truth. It is important to know the truth about God as revealed in the Bible and not just to rely on our own stale opinions about him. People need to hear the truth before they can believe it. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you also believed, you were sealed in Christ with the promised Holy Spirit. That's Ephesians 1 and verse 13. And it goes on to say that the Holy Spirit is a down payment on our inheritance as believers in the one true God. And so today, I want to affirm again, the Bible tells us the truth about God, the truth about Jesus, and the truth about ourselves. We need to believe it, and then we need to tell it, to share it with others. Remember, the Bible is God's word to people, not just people's ideas about God. It is impossible to have an accurate idea of what God is like if you ignore or reject the Bible. Jesus is the perfect revealer of God. When you look at Jesus, when you look at his character, you see exactly what God is like. But how would we know what Jesus was like if we hadn't had it written down in the Bible? Today, as we come to Holy Communion, I want you to remember that we come to the one who not only told us the truth, but the one who is the truth. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. 
He told us that he is the truth. Over and over again he affirmed, I tell you the truth. He told us the truth about God. He told us the truth about himself. And he told us the truth about ourselves. We acknowledge today that we have sinned and need your forgiveness. We thank you that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood so that we could be forgiven. Thank you, Jesus, that you took the penalty that we deserved that you paid the debt we could not pay. Thank you that you are the truth and that you have made it possible for us to know the truth. And when we know the one who is true, we are set free. Free to live the life for which you created us. Free to be a part of your great forever family. Free to tell the truth to others. Be especially close to us now as we come to the table of communion. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.